good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming, especially those who've been on the London Legal Walk today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, my name is Marcus Findlay, and I'm on the Young Lawyers Committee for the Human Rights Lawyers Association. And it's a pleasure to welcome to you to our first event of the year. Um, tonight's theme is mental health and human rights, and it's a pleasure to have uh, the best in the business speaking tonight. Um, and I'll introduce them in a second. But there's just a few preliminary matters that I will uh, uh, mention before. Um, first of all, we're not expecting a fire alarm. So if you do hear any alarms, please do vacate the building as quickly as you can. Um, toilets are just through, through here, and there's an accessible toilet on the ground floor as well. Um, the event is going to be filmed as well, um, so please be aware of that before making any uh, comments. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll just let us have some th quick thank yous as well. Thank you, thank you very much to Matrix Chambers for hosting us this evening, and particularly Michael Etienne for organising that. Um, they've also provided us with some fantastic drinks reception, which we're very grateful for. Um, and also to Angela Patrick, who's been a big supporter of this event. So, um, before I hand over, I would just like to introduce our speakers. Chairing the talks this evening, to my right, is Renette Prime, who, who sits on our executive committee. Um, Renette is a solicitor at the London Borough of Hackney and has over nine years of experience in the field of adult social care. Um, she frequently represents patients in mental health review tri tribunals across the UK, including Broadmoor, Rampton, and other high secure institutions. She has worked for MIND, the mental health charity, where she set up a community advocacy service in Hammersmith. She has also interned for the Equal Justice Initiative in Alabama, providing legal representation for prisoners on death row. Um, our first speaker this evening, speaking on court protection and public bodies, is Victoria Butler Cole. She is a barrister at 39 Essex Street Chambers, specialising in mental health law and community care. She acts in human rights claims arising from care and treatment of mentally impaired children and adults. She has been instructed by Liberty in cases arising from the Winterbourne View scandal and has currently instructed a number of claims in relation to the use of calm rooms and physical restraint. Before coming to the bar, Victoria was involved in the field of medical ethics and public policy and we're looking forward to hearing her insights from, from that during the talk. Uh, second to her right is Professor Jill P.A., who is Professor of Law at the LSC and a member of the Mannheim Centre for um, Criminology and Criminal Justice. Her research interests include mental health law, of course, decision making and uh, treatment of mentally disordered offenders. She has a PhD in psychology from the University of Birmingham and is a qualified barrister. She joined the LSE in 1996, having previously <coughs> been employed by Brunel University and the Oxford University Centre for Criminological Research. Last but not least um, is Oliver Lewis, who will be speaking on mental health and the international community. Um, Oliver has over 15 years of international experience at the interface of mental health law and intellectual disability and human rights. Until yesterday, he was the uh, CEO of Validity, the uh, mental health NGO which was formerly known as the Mental Disability Advocacy Centre, an international human rights NGO uh, that uses law to secure equality, inclusion and justice. He also sits on the board of Avon and the Bristol Law Centre and Pilnet, Hungary. He is an associate barrister at Doughty Street Chambers here in London and is also a professor of law and, law and social justice at the University of Leeds. Finally, he is currently researching the role of psychiatrists in human rights abuses with, with mental health systems, in particular professional bodies like the World Psychiatric Association. So we hope you enjoy tonight's discussion. We hope you contribute to the uh, Q&A afterwards, and we hope you enjoy for a drink at the end as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. no, Thank you, Marcus. Um, as mentioned earlier, I am recently joined the Exec Committee of the Human Rights Law Association, so it is my privilege to be a part of this event today. Um, and thank you again for joining us. It's a beautiful day. You could have been anywhere else, but you chose to be here, so I really appreciate that. Um, and it's actually good timing for us to have an event on mental health because it's been quite an eventful year so far in relation to mental health law. 
Um, just a few weeks ago, we had the Mental Health Awareness Week, and um, it doesn't take much of a poll to realise that um, mental health and de the debate around that is shifting, and it's shifting in the right direction for us. Um, it wasn't long ago that um, a high-profile footballer, um, Aaron Lennon, was sectioned in a state of mental distress. And the media coverage on that was one of somebody who was more understanding and sympathetic of his situation. And if you roll back probably 10 or 12 years ago, compare that to the situation when Bruno was locked up. The Sun proclaimed bonkers Bruno locked up. And that was quite a shock to see that headline. But we've come quite a way, not all the way, but we've come quite some way from those kinds of perceptions. And as a mental health advocate, I am happy to see that the royals are now on board with this. We have William and Harry talking about their distress of the grief of their mother. And again, this is all helping towards genuine parity between mental health <coughs> and physical health. Because as we know, they're not all treated the same, either people's public perception or even in institutions. Um, in any town or city these days, you will see people living on the streets. Many of them are clearly mentally ill. Most of the time we walk by them, maybe some of us even a little bit quicker. But would we do the same if the streets were filled with somebody who was who had midway through a stroke or who'd fallen over and broken their ankle or their hip? We wouldn't do that. We'd call the ambulance service straight away and we'd ask the medics to come and administer some kind of help to them. If the medic on the line came to us and said, well, I'm sorry, I can't treat the person who's just had an accident, you're going to have to wait for two weeks we'd be pointing accusations at the ambulance service straight away saying, what are you doing? That's an acceptable service. And yet this is the experience that mentally ill people face sometimes on a daily basis. Um, the number of young people arriving in A&E with psychiatric problems has doubled since 2009. And yet the waiting list for therapeutic services such as CBT is at least six months. The chief inspector from prisons has described the rise in self-harm and suicide in prisons as shocking, with 58 suicides in 2010, rising to 119 deaths in 2016. And during this period of austerity, we have 6,000 6, fewer mental health nurses to serve a population of over 21,000 patients in our mental health hospitals, a result of an 8% cut in mental health funding. So the fight for greater openness and equality as a result of the awareness campaigns is all well and good, but if it's not matched with any increase in resources, then we have a problem. Theresa May is the second successive Prime Minister to declare that mental health is not all about money, pledging <laughs> that no child will have to be treated away from their local areas by 2021. The question is, can we afford to wait any longer? <coughs> Earlier this year, the Government's Joint Committee on Human Rights published a report seeking to establish whether a human rights-based approach could lead to better prevention of deaths in prison with people with mental health problems. So the question that we're posing our panel today is how can human rights ensure people with mental illnesses are treated with the right kind of care? There are many examples in case law, many of us here are some academics and students, where human, um, human rights has highlighted the need for greater protection of the mentally ill. Some of you may be familiar with the case of um, Rabone and Pennine Care NHS Foundation Trust in 2012, where the Supreme Court found that the hospital had failed to take reasonable steps to protect the life of a high-risk young woman who hanged herself the day after being discharged. The Supreme Court held that the state had a positive obligation to act when life is endangered. And then we have the case of MSN UK 2012, where the European Court ruled that the police had breached the man's Article 3 rights by detaining him for three days in circumstances where he repeatedly banged his head on the wall and drank from the toilet. And at a time when the NHS is undergoing transformation and private companies are increasingly being used to provide public care, can human rights ensure that such companies are held at the same standards as public authorities? And these are the dilemmas that we're having to face now. So, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Victoria, to give a brief presentation on the work of the Court Protection and Mental Health Law in general. Hello. Ten minutes. 
called Protection of Public Bodies on the basis that apparently I have to assume that you may have no prior knowledge about it at all. So given that I see at least five people who have a vast amount of knowledge about it, you can fall asleep for the next ten minutes. And there won't be any profound insights in this section, although we might go into those later. And um, this is more the sort of nutshell guide. Um, so called, what is called protection? If you are an avid reader of the Daily Mail, you'll know that it's a secret court full of terrifying judges who make alarming decisions in secret uh, and uh, can't, you know, uh, no one can get in and it's all, it's all shocking and awful. Um, uh, actually, um, it's, uh, it was created by the Medical Capacity Act. It's, it's not a court, it's judges all over the country uh, sitting as court of protection judges and with a huge range of powers. And actually the most common thing that the court of protection does is um, the relatively boring thing of appointing deputies for people who can't manage their own financial affairs. And so the court of protection makes lots of orders just on the papers with no judges involved at all, um, sanctioning the appointment of a financial deputy, for example, for someone who's had a brain injury and has a personal injury payment that, he, that needs managing. Um, that's the sort of bulk of the court's work, although it's not the interesting bit. Um, the interesting bit is the court's power to decide um, whether or not someone has capacity to make a decision for themselves, and if they haven't, to take a decision for them in their best interests. And there are some limits on what the court can do. So the court can't make best interest decisions about um, certain uh, matters. So you'd be relieved to know that even if you were found to lack capacity by a court protection judge, uh, the judge could not decide whether it was in your best interest to have a sexual relationship with someone else uh, or to marry them. So uh, that's probably a relief. Uh, the, um, but apart from those very sort of, uh, narrowly defined limits, the court can make best interest decisions of any sort. And there's no um, guidance at all uh, in the Act uh, about how you decide what's in someone's best interests, other than taking into account all the relevant circumstances, uh, which uh, is all very well and good, but of course it's completely devoid of principle and is completely open to the sort of subjective um, judgment of whoever it is who's making the decision. And in the same way that you might ask 10 psychiatrists what they think is in someone's best interests and get 10 different answers, that you're autistic, that you have a brain injury, that you have some kind of degenerative illness like dementia or Huntington's, um, there are all sorts of um, reasons why you might have to lack capacity in addition to a range of mental health diagnoses. Um, unfortunately, um, on its face, the Mental Capacity Act appears to be incompatible with the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which says, don't do this. Don't tell people that they lack capacity and then make decisions for them. That's not how it's supposed to work. Um, but despite the court protection having been in existence for um, coming up for 10 years, uh, there haven't been any cases where the courts grappled with that rather than a fundamental problem. It's sort of just ploughed on, going, hmm, <laughs> very interesting. Um, we've got to just apply this statute and see where we get to. Um, and, and it is a really interesting question because, of course, um, it's easy to just say, well, yeah, but if someone's in a coma, of course you have to make a decision for them. It's ridiculous to say that you're going to support them to make their own decision. They're not able to communicate with you. Um, and that's all very well and good. But well, that's not, um, you know, that's not the, the difficult case. The difficult case are the many cases that come before the court about people with mild learning disabilities or autism or some impairment in the functioning of their mind or brain, which means that they are actually capable of making a decision. It's just not one that other people think is the right one. And because the court is a civil court and everything proceeds on the balance of probabilities, you only have to show that it's more likely than not that someone lacks capacity for the court's powers to be able to be invoked. And there's an um, interesting question about whether that's really the right approach and whether deciding all of this on the balance of probabilities is appropriate, given that what you're then unleashing is the power of the court to make all sorts of really fundamental decisions for someone about where they live, who they spend time with, what sort of care they receive, what they can and can't do with their time. Um, the court also makes decisions, sort of life and death decisions, which are the ones that the media tend to report about withdrawal of treatment from people. Um, <coughs> But um, my view anyway is that actually those, those are not the interesting cases in terms of the court's powers and what the court can and can't do. Um, those cases tend to just be the court's sort of evaluating uh, medical opinion about you know, people's um, medical treatment and prognosis and making decisions that are slightly more, less complicated, I think, in many ways than decisions about where someone with a learning disability ought to live and what contact they ought to have with their family. Um, the court of protection is limited in what it can do in that you, as a court of protection judge, are, if, although you're not making the decision that the person themselves would have made, because that would be a substituted 
judgment approach, which we don't have, um, you are nevertheless only able to make decisions that the person themselves could have made if they had capacity. So although it's unquestionably in my best interest to have a very long all expenses paid holiday at the Bahamas starting mm -hmm. next week, um, that's not an order that the court protection could make even if I lack capacity. Um, the court protection identifies what's available to someone and then chooses which of those things um, should happen. So in relation to um, the provision of care by statutory bodies and the funding of that, um, you uh, spend a lot of time in the court of protection arguing with statutory bodies about what provision they're willing to make available. And of course, um, very often that's a lot less than you would like because they haven't got any money. And you can, to some extent, in the court of protection, in a way that you perhaps can't do in judicial review, uh, require public authorities to be a bit more creative about what they're willing to offer and to look at alternatives that they might have discounted. But you can't force them to make resources available that aren't available. Uh, and you can't force them to do things that they um, refuse to do in a public law sense. Yeah, if you get to that sort of standoff, you have to um, take them to court, an administrative court. Um, so that's sort of in, in four minutes how the court protection sort of works in, in relation to these sorts of um, cases. And since the focus of this evening is human rights and how that plays into it, um, it's sort of um, interesting, really, because most of the court protection reported cases don't really mention human rights. Or if they do, they're sort of at the end, and the judge sort of makes a best interest decision and then says, oh, and by the way, that satisfies everyone else, everyone's Article 8 rights, so that's all fine. And um, the, uh, there was a case a few years ago where a family member of uh, a young adult with a learning disability tried to persuade the court that there was a sort of starting point that learning disabled adults should live with their families, and if you wanted to intervene in that, then you would have to kind of over, you, you'd start from the presumption that that was the way, right way forward. And the court of appeal said, no, that, that's not how it works. Best interest means everything's open, you just, you know, there are no presumptions you just look at everything and figure out what you think the right answer is. And, and it's too quick to say, well, you know, let's have an Article 8 presumption, because of course the person who's the subject of the proceedings has got their own Article 8 rights, and their Article 8 rights might be in conflict with those of their family. In fact, their own Article 8 rights might, might be in conflict with each other, because they might want, they might have simultaneously want to um, privacy and sort of uh, to be um, separate from family members, but at the same time have relationships with them. And so it's, it, it's a bit too, um, uh, difficult to try and invent or, or create or derive from Article 8 principles that are actually going to help improve the way the court deals with best interests. And so what the court has done over the 10 years it's been in existence is to evolve its own sort of principles about um, really centering on the importance of doing what people want, even if they lack capacity. And it's been a really noticeable change, and perhaps most evident in medical treatment cases, where there's been a move from sort of almost automatically saying, well, if you lack capacity and you need this medical treatment, of course it's in your best interest to have it, to a case uh, not that long ago where the evidence was that the man would die without a, his leg being amputated and he couldn't make the decision for himself because he had schizophrenia and he was unable to weigh all the relevant information. But he didn't want his leg amputated <coughs> and the judge said, well, it's not in his best interest to do it against his wishes. And so there's been an incredible change, I think, from sort of... Um, doing what professionals say to really the court trying to put themselves in, in the shoes of the person concerned, look at things from their perspective and try and figure out um, what's in their best interests based on that. And so although we don't have a substituted judgment test, and although we do have a system which is uh, potentially incompatible with the UN Convention, actually the way that the courts have come to apply it sort of dissolve some of those problems by focusing very much now on what the person themselves would have wanted and trying to do the things that fit with their wishes, even though they've been found to be someone who lacks capacity. Um, and then I've got like one more minute, do you think? Yes. One minute, okay. It's lucky I, it's lucky I speak too quickly, isn't it? Um, and then the last area of human rights which has really um, sort of struck the court in recent years is the dreaded Article 5, Declaration of Liberty, because uh, the Supreme Court um, said uh, Deprecation of liberty can apply to benign, even really great care arrangements in the community. Um, it's not about your intentions, it's about the effect of the level of control and supervision that you have over people. And as a result of that judgment, 
the, the entire sort of social work system has almost broken down because now tens of thousands of people are deprived of their liberty for purposes of Article 5. There aren't enough people to assess those deprivations between the community, to get them authorised, to bring them to the court to be authorised. Once they get to court, there are not enough advocates so that the people concerned have their voice heard within the proceedings. So there are, I think at the moment, 200 cases stayed, waiting for the government to back down and agree to pay for advocates for people in those cases. And Article 5 applies to everyone, and you can't get out of it just by saying, oh, but this is in someone's best interest to actually a system where resources are probably being diverted from where they're more needed in terms of actual care assessment and provision and into dealing with legal processes. And uh, the best um, example of this, if you're uh, on Twitter, uh, is to follow um, Mark Neary, who was uh, involved in one of the seminal court protection cases about deprivation of liberty when his son was um, kept away from him for a long period of time without any proper authorization and eventually was returned home. Uh, and at that time, um, his son was perceived as being deprived of his liberty while he was in the unit where he was being kept, but not deprived of his liberty when he went back to his own home uh, in the community. But of course now, because of the Supreme Court decision <coughs> in Cheshire West, he's just been assessed as being deprived of his liberty in his own home. Mm. And so his dad posted some excellent photos uh, yesterday, I think, or possibly yeah, this morning on Twitter, uh, of his son being deprived of his liberty at an ABBA tribute concert. All <laughs> <laughs> uh, completely tongue-in-cheek, because of course Stephen's there dancing with his care workers and his dad. But that is now done as, an inf as a situation which um, brings into play Article 5 and then requires legal safeguards. So. Um, that topic in particular at the moment in legal protection is one that is rumbling on and shows no signs of going anywhere. Um, also in relation to um, uh, secure residential schools, there are all sorts of areas where the sort of ramifications of it haven't been fully worked out, but where it, it raises all sorts of interesting questions about whether, um, about the, the scope of um, particularly Article 5 and how you can actually make sure that your human rights law is actually benefiting the people that you think it ought to be benefiting, rather than perhaps just giving the lawyers more work to do. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I, could, I should actually just mention, we're going to have the presentations, 10 minutes slots, and then I may interview with a few questions for the panellists, and then the Q&A for the rest of you will be near the end, so you have a lot of time to, to build up your questions. But Victoria, you can sit down. No, that's fine, I'm going to wait for you. Okay. I was going to ask a quick question. Um, only because I saw a few people jotting things down. The case that um, Victoria referred to regarding the person who had the leg amputated oh, yes. is the Y Valley NHS Trust and B case. Yep. I just had one question in relation to that because sure. um, the judge made a very good point about that. Um, Peter Justice Jackson mentioned in relation to people who lack capacity and have to make the court has to make decisions for themselves. He said that. When somebody lacks capacity, this is not an on and off switch in relation to their rights and freedoms. So just because they they know and can do that for themselves doesn't mean that their rights and freedoms are automatically taken away. Yeah. Um, and my question really is, in the face of that case where somebody literally, if he didn't have the amputation done, he would have lost his life, he would have died, where does that place doctors in their duties towards saving lives and preserving life? Because ultimately, we're moving closer or further away from a paternalistic model yeah. of the patient's needs come first, the doctor knows first, to actually I have the autonomy over my body, even if it means it's an unwise decision in your eyes. So yeah. where does that place? So uh, that decision is, re is really interesting. And if yeah. you, I've spoken about it um, in various talks to psychiatrists in particular, mm -hmm. most of whom sort of roll their eyes as if say, what? what was the judge thinking, you know, mm -hmm. thinking, and, and, and one, of the, one of the psychiatrists said, well, but couldn't it have just been sectioned? Um, he probably was sectioned at the time, but I don't think that's the solution to the problem. Yeah. Um, I don't think amputation is yet a treatment for mental disorder. Yeah. <laughs> and, but um, but that, uh, that problem of um, how you translate what the court is doing to what people do in practice is really difficult, and with good reason, because if you're a social worker, deciding whether it's in the best interest of an elderly person with dementia to live in squalor in their own home and refuse access to carers, you're not just thinking Peter Jackson, autonomy, you yeah, know, best exactly. interest. You're thinking coroner, inquest, you know, yeah. disciplinary Down the line proceedings. For myself, yeah. Exactly. And so for every Peter Jackson decision, there's an Ombudsman report, say, criticising the professionals involved for not having stepped in. 
But I think what the court has made very clear, and obviously the downside is it's an expensive process, is that that's what the court's for. Make it the court's problem. If you're not sure, if you think that this very risky strategy might be the person's the right thing yeah. to do, um, then you can go to the court, and they can be the ones who make the decision and, and, and sort of suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. And you don't really want to have to take all these cases to court. You'd rather have a sort of more, um, you know, an ethos of promoting people's wishes in the community without requiring lawyers to get involved. But um, there was a case a good few years ago where I think it was a lecturer, Mr Justice Headley, was a judge at the time, said um, that he didn't think a High Court judge had been sacked since 1689 or something. He was making the point that actually it's a lot easier for judges to make difficult decisions than it is for the, you know, the social worker who happens to have been allocated mm -hmm. to the case. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so over to Jill. Thank you. Um, Marcus has also asked me to keep this um, accessible, uh, which is um, a good thing, because like, there are lots of areas here that I actually struggle with. So. Um, anyone who wants to know more, uh, there is my book, Mental Health and Crime, um, and there's also an article in the International Journal of Law and Psychiatry on the very problematic relationship between the ECHR and the UNCRPD with respect to criminal capacity issues, so they're available for people who want to do more. Um, mental Health and Criminal Justice covers a multitude of topics, offenders, victims, courts, witnesses, the police, Forensic patients and obviously lawyers. Um, and I'm just going to touch on a couple of areas that it kind of illustrate the diversity of human rights issues in this area. And I want to start with Brenda Hale in 2007, because Brenda Hale said in 2007, um, she wrote this article uh, entitled The Human Rights Act and Mental Health Law. Has it helped? <laughs> Um, and she responded to her own question with the short and gloomy answer must be not very much. Now, the bulk of her article concerned civil patients, and indeed the bulk of the Mental Health Act concerns civil patients, not forensic patients. Um, and I'm not certain the same dismal answer applies in the field of mental health and criminal justice. Um, however, there are some things I think it's important to grasp here. Um, People who offend in the context of a co-occurring mental disability pose a number of challenges for human rights, and I think there are four that we need to kind of think about. First, why is it um, so problematic? Well, uh, people who offend with mental disabilities are both obviously the repositories of human rights, but they are also the infringers of other people's rights. And that raises all sorts of difficulties as to whether or not we should treat people as offenders or as patients. And I think the furore last week over Ian Brady captures that very well. Second, um, there are questions concerning whether or not people should be subject to conviction under the criminal law. Are they fit to stand trial? Should their mental state mitigate their sentence? Should it prevent their conviction in the first place? And, there are lots of difficult issues here, but this is very f fertile ground for lawyers, and it's fertile for lawyers because the majority of these offender patients have capacity. They're able to instruct lawyers, and often they are quite litigious. Fourth, why is success limited? Well, it's limited because the ECHR itself uh, limits what it's possible to do. So if you just think briefly about Article 8, the rights to respect for private and family life, given by 8.1, but 8.2 allows it to be interfered with on the basis of the prevention of disorder or crime, the protection of health or morals, and for the protection of the rights and freedom of others. Now, mentally disordered offenders get caught by all three of those limbs. So it becomes quite problematic when thinking about, is it possible to justify? Because in most cases, it is going to be possible to justify what would otherwise be a breach. So, the ECHR gives with one hand, takes away with the other. I would argue, however, that mentally disordered offenders have been standard bearers in the developments of, of, of human rights. And if you think first about the case of X in the United Kingdom from 1981, um, X was a man detained in Broadmoor. Um, the 1959 Mental Health Act gave no powers to tribunals to discharge him, so he was reliant on the Secretary of State. The ECHR and the European Court of Human Rights said um, that's not good enough. You know, the Secretary of State is not independent. He's a member of the executive. People who are detained have to have the right of access to a court that can discharge them. So the 1983 Act 
actually gave tribunals the power to do that. And following in the wake of that, there were a whole series of cases which pursued exactly the same argument about the lack of independence by the Secretary of State, the role of executive discretion. So um, if you think about uh, the long-term detention of children, of discretionary life sentence prisoners, of mandatory life sentence prisoners, in all of those areas, rights were taken away from the Secretary of State and put into statute in various forms to ensure that um, these people who were detained uh, had rights of access to bodies that could discharge them. Second, um, the case of H um, in 2001. Uh, H was the first declaration of incompatibility after the passage of the 1988 Human Rights Act. Um, so mental health got in there first with the declaration of incompatibility, and that was a case that concerned um, the tribunals, again, the tribunals' powers to discharge, and it, uh, in effect, reversed the burdens so that it always had to be the case that tribunals could fail to discharge if they were not satisfied, that there were not grounds for further detention, and H put that into the positive, so tribunals could only continue to detain if a positive case was made out. So, kind of important cases um, which have had real influence um, on mental health law. Now, in the remaining time, I just want to talk briefly about two cases, and um, both of them turned on the degree of disorder of a participant. In the first case, it concerned the actual degree of disorder, and in the second, the attributed degree of disorder. The first is DD and the Secretary of State for the Home Department um, from 2015. Now, DD was someone who was subject to a Terrorism Prevention and Investigation Act order. So he had to wear an electronic tag. Um, when he was released from prison, the order was revived. And he appealed against the Secretary of State's decision to, to revive that order. Um, he had suffered from appalling trauma um, in Somalia, which had led to post-traumatic stress disorder. But he'd also developed a psychotic illness with auditory hallucinations and paranoid beliefs. He was suicidal. He <coughs> And so there was a very serious risk of self-harm to him as well. He believed the electronic tag he was wearing on his ankle was there to punish him. He said that there were noises and voices emanating from it, and that it contained a camera and a bomb. Now, he was not thought to be making this up by the clinicians who assessed him. Um, and they argued that the removal of the tag would improve his condition. There were also issues about whether or not his mental state had affected his decisions that constituted the breach of the T-PIN in the first instance. Now, Article 3 is drafted in absolute terms, so there can be no justification for breaching it. But um, in order to uh, satisfy uh, Article 3, um, there's a very high threshold that has to be crossed. There's also a degree of deference to the Secretary of State when it comes to measures to protect the public uh, from acts of terrorism um, and the proportionality test as well. But there was scope, the court argued, for the court to give intense scrutiny for the necessity of the T-PIN and to explore the alternatives uh, means of achieving the result that the, the Secretary of State wanted to achieve. And they said the more grave the impact of the measure, and clearly it was very grave on him because it had driven him, driven him into a suicidal state, the more compelling must be the need for the restriction. So when thinking about Article 3 breach, you have to think about the medical condition of the individual, the <coughs> adequacy of the medical help provided, and the advisability of the measures given the state of health of the individual. Um, the court was also aware that given this man's mental state, he really wasn't in a position to take um, effective uh, activities in the uh, terrorism field. So the court decided that Article 3 had been breached. Um, but one of the really important things that they said, because this was a second application to court, and there was a difference between Oosley's first judgment and uh, Collins's second judgment, is that his mental state had deteriorated between the two applications. And so what the court said was that 
Um, conduct which is inhumane or degrading for one vulnerable individual can constitute breach, but it would not do so for another individual. So the degree of disorder actually affected whether or not breach was going to occur. Um, so court held there was breach. They took into account his vulnerability to degradation, his risk of suicide, his suffering with respect to his deluded beliefs, and his capacity to conduct, conduct terrorism-related activities. So human rights made a difference there. The clinicians and the offender's wife really uh, acted as the gatekeepers to his um, use of uh, Article 3. Second case, um, very quick, is uh, B and DPP from 2009. This was a judicial review of the CPS's decision to discontinue a prosecution against a defendant who allegedly bit off the ear of another man. The perpetrator was charged with wounding with intent and witness intimidation. The victim had a history of mental illness. Now, the decision was taken by the CPS um, at court without the victim having arrived at court on the basis of a short and rather blunt medical report, which suggested that the victim's reliability could be undermined because his mental disorder might affect his perception and recollection of events. But the victim and offender were well known to one another, and the victim had no paranoid beliefs about the offender. And the victim went to court and said this decision was irrational and in breach of Article 3, because there's a positive obligation to provide a legal system for bringing to justice those who commit serious acts of violence. And he also argued that this was in breach of the Disability Discrimination Act. The court had submissions from mind that cases were far too readily being dropped because the victim's evidence was perceived to be unreliable because of mental health problems. And indeed, the doctor was coming to court, but the CPS made the decision before the doctor even arrived. So there was an argument that either his report had been misread or that there was unfounded stereotyping. So the decision to uh, drop was unlawful, it was irreversible, it was in breach of Article 3, and the court awarded £8,000 in 2009. And it's right that they should have done that, because if they hadn't have done that, any victim with a mental health problem could, in effect, have been the subject with impunity of assault by anybody else. So, there are big picture issues, there are small picture issues, but I think there's plenty of scope um, to argue human rights points in the field of mental health and criminal justice. And in many respects, I think the courts are very sympathetic, and I think there's an open goal here for you all. Thank you. So, um, good evening. My name is Oliver Lewis. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as was mentioned, I've spent 15 years working in an organisation uh, which uses law to challenge unjust laws and situations where people with mental health issues or intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, um, have been victims of um, human rights violations. <clears throat> and the work was focused mostly in Central Eastern Europe um, and Africa, so I just want to draw from that experience um, and, and tell you some sort of like global concerns um, which are m much more um, macro than the um, issues that Tor and Jill have been talking about. And there have been some great pictures, as you can see, this, <laughs> took this in uh, Kenya, brilliant skies. Um, So I think that we can characterise um, some of the global concerns around mental health and international human rights law. Um, and, and these concerns have come out in a document which I think both Jill and Tor mentioned, which is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, as being a tension between, on the one hand, segregation and inclusion in our communities, <clears throat> and how to get that right. What are the various different forms of segregation? Uh, we've heard about segregation in um, care homes. <coughs> we've heard about bizarre forms of segregation in one's own home. 
But then there are also um, genuine forms of segregation in one's own, own home if supports aren't there to enable people to access the community um, as they want. There are also other forms of segregation in prisons, in big psychiatric hospitals, asylums, um, and in many developing countries, um, segregation because you might be uh, labelled as what historically in this country might have been called a village idiot, um, or you may be considered that you've been possessed by the devil, uh, which is the understanding of madness in, in uh, many locations, and be treated uh, by a traditional healer um, or tied to a tree for years and years. So the various different forms of segregation, um, and there's various different forms of inclusion, um, and coupled with that of disability, where your problems as a disabled person or as a person with mental health issues are almost your fault. You are the problem, uh, whether it's brain imbalances, whether it's um, your broken leg, whatever it is. The individual is the problem, and that's caused inclusive, more friendly um, to everyone. And, and the fixing happens at different layers, whether that's environmental, uh, by that I mean the built environment, cities, transportation, uh, whether it's about legal barriers, um, outmoded legislation, and, and the CRPD itself also talks about attitudinal barriers, which in my experience is the number one um, issue. So, um, just going to give examples from three different countries which um, I visited, and I took this picture, this is uh, pictures published in an MDAC report that the organisation published in 2014. Um, and in developing countries, uh, one of the huge problems is what the WHO calls the treatment gap. That is the difference between the number of people who have mental health issues, and you don't need to pathologize it, um, versus the amount of support or treatment which is available. And so if you're a farmer in rural Uganda, uh, then if you get depression, if you're the sole breadwinner um, and have children, then the whole family um, is going to be plunged into poverty and there's very little access to mental health care. And so while the WHO and many um, organizations and uh, professional service providers within this thing called the global, the movement for global mental health are trying to roll out treatment, mainly in the form of medication, to masses of people to make medication and other psychosocial interventions more accessible. From a human rights point of view, that all seems really great from the right to health and the right to access um, things which are going to make your life better, but actually really what's on offer is things like this. So this is from Butabika Hospital in Kampala, the capital of Uganda. This is the seclusion room where you can be hospitalized, uh, you arrive in manacles and there's, a, there's a, a, like a shackle cutter that nurses have because that's so common and there's no operating mental health law, so all detention and treatment decisions, forced treatment decisions, are made there and then by trained-ish nurses, mostly without any medical supervision. <coughs> you can be put into seclusion just on the basis of someone's whim. There's, there are no rules governing what happens to you in there, and obviously from a human rights point of view, um, the, these issues are obvious, and, and our, the organisation um, which I led um, is litigating the first case on segregation um, or solitary confinement um, in, uh, in Africa, as far as we know. Um, that's going through the Ugandan courts. India, so this is a photo I took um, in the Tane uh, Mental Asylum, the largest psychiatric hospital in Asia, with, I think, with over, over 2,000 beds. And this is in the epilepsy ward. Um, but effectively all these patients who are detained on mats in a huge room, uh, some of those people have, um, you know, there's feces on some of the mats, and this is in the middle of the day, uh, and obviously people are medicated up to the eyeballs that they're sleeping, um, and these are all people with learning disabilities, or autism, or something like that. Um, so this, I just wanted to illustrate that um, not only people with mental health issues, who are sort of captured by the mental health system. There's a huge level of abandonment about anyone who's different, uh, irrespective of what the psychiatric label might or might not be. Um, and the state's response 
um, in India and in many countries is to segregate so that psychiatry is used as a social dustbin to take in people who are abandoned, who may be walking um, down the street and, and need some form of care uh, and support. Um, but this form of quote unquote care and support is cheap and not very cheerful. Um, and again, this is, this is a huge problem because so many people are segregated from society that um, inclusion, but the, the abandonment becomes the norm and inclusion becomes really, really difficult. That said, of course, there are many NGOs, India is a vast country, many NGOs providing alternatives to um, this, this form of segregation. And in India, the uh, local civil society organizations have used the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to demand <coughs> something better than this. And a couple of months ago, there was a new Mental Health Act, which was um, uh, which which is yet to come into force, but was enacted uh, by the Parliament. Um, so, again, at the grassroots level, the CRPD, this highfalutin UN document, is being used by grassroots organisations in India. And finally, Bulgaria. Um, this is a case that I was um, involved in at MDAC, and we we took together with a uh, a um, NGO in Bulgaria, the Bulgarian Health Security Committee. Essentially, this is Rusi Stanev, and he was a man who had to spend eight years in an institution uh, with squalid conditions where there was a 10% mortality rate for a number of years in the winter just because of malnutrition uh, and a lack of heating, um, lack of basic um, medicines. And he spent eight years in this social care institution, and because the local organization did regular monitoring, they picked up his case, which we together litigated. This is a picture I took. Um, obviously, you can see this is Strasbourg behind him. We won the case at the Grand Chamber in 2012. First ever case uh, where someone detained in the social care system was found to have the Article eight, uh, 5 rights violated, and first ever Article 3 case in an, any disability um, situation in the Strasbourg, Strasbourg um, jurisprudence. And after that case, after the judgment came out, the Bulgarian government ratified the CRPD two weeks later, ten days later, maybe a coincidence, but it also opened up um, a discussion between civil society and the government. A working party was established to look into a, a better system whereby people um, who were deemed to lack capacity were placed under guardianship. And so there's now a, a supported decision-making bill um, and this really acted as this case acted as a, a spark, a catalyst for wider societal discussions in the media uh, and, and policy interactions um, with the government. Um, and at, as he was flying to um, Strasbourg, he said he characterised his case in, in the following way. In a translation from the Bulgarian, he said, "I'm a person." I'm not an object, I need my freedom, which I think is a really neat way of um, describing what this is all about. It's about personhood, it's about freedom, it's about not being objectified. And sadly, Rusi um, passed away a couple of um, months ago, unfortunately, uh, still under guardianship. We, we were uh, working with local lawyers to try and get him out of the shackles of guardianship, but the Bulgarian government and the courts there um, had different, <coughs> different opinions. So, in conclusion, our work um, internationally is, I think, what I've learned is that human rights, obviously, it, it, you know, treaties, laws, they're a legal tool. They have normative force. You can argue points on behalf of people in courtrooms, as Tor does on a daily basis. Right? That's really, really important to secure justice and spark a wider sort of cascading effect towards law reform. But human rights are more than that. Human rights have an educational force, can be used as an educational tool. I've, I've given uh, presentations or workshops under trees in rural Maharashtra where people are studying the CRPD and then going out to their local towns and demanding their rights. Um, in an, in an, I think that's, that's amazing. It gives people a vocabulary, it gives people a framework to argue, oh, I've faced this situation which has made me miserable, miserable, 
and now I can point to the articles and I can educate the policymakers who may not have a clue about the CRPD and the policymakers, the duty bearers under international human rights law can then learn about this and can integrate this in their practice. And thirdly, um, yeah. more seriously, <coughs> human rights have an expressive power. Uh, they, they can empower people, um, they can provide people with, with confidence. They, they mean something beyond the hardcore way in which <coughs> treaties are argued um, in courtrooms. And they provide people with almost an identity or help people figure out an identity and help people um, build confidence and have a pride in what they're asking for. Um, so if you're at the start of your career wanting to be a human rights lawyer, please remember that human rights are about laws, but they're about, they're more than that. The Human Rights Project is something that people on the ground can use, and lawyers are in a privileged position to help people um, uh, facilitate that to happen. And the impact, of course, can be measured in litigation and, and law reform uh, ways, but also in other ways too. Thank you very much. Can I just ask our panel to return to the table so that we can have a very um, brief Q&A? We have about 20 minutes allocated now. That well, but what strikes me is a lack of outrage about human rights abuses in mental health, particularly in the less sort of sympathetic type cases, so not so much in learning disabilities and with older people, but someone mentioned terrorism, your sort of classic media coverage of paranoid schizophrenics, etc. And I wondered what the panel thought about what's the chronology between uh, law reform, if we need it, is the Mental Health Act part of a rather old conception of mental health? What's the relationship between law reform and society's attitudes, basically? What, what has to change first? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> it's a big question. It's a good question. <laughs> I'm going to make a political point. Um, I think there needs to be a great deal more education amongst the public. Um, I, we've obviously come a long way from where we were before, but um, certainly education amongst the public and education amongst politicians as well. Um, I was saying to Oliver when we walked over here earlier today about the Tory party manifesto. The Tory party manifesto says we're going to have a new mental health act and they say in their manifesto this is going to be the first <laughs> manifesto, the, the first um, mental health act for 35 years. <laughs> now, they clearly had in mind the 1983 mental health act, but in actual fact we've had three mental health bills mm -hmm. since then and one mental health act. They then went on to say, well, of course, the thing we really need to tackle is um, community treatment orders because people go on to community treatment orders and they can't get off them. This is, you know, not good enough. And of course, the 2007 Mental Health Act was the one that introduced community treatment tools. It didn't used to be there under the Mental Health Act 1983. So there is a, a very, very long way to go amongst our politicians in terms of getting them to understand the issues. And there's an awful long way to go amongst the public in terms of getting them to put pressure on politicians to do something about the issue. But I think you're right, unpicking what the chronology is very tricky. Can I just add one response? Is the, um, that's a hugely complicated, like empirical question, which academics could spend years studying, right? And I, I mean, my approach um, with advocacy is, you know, it's like if someone gives you a, like 20 tennis balls, like, and you, like this, and you throw them all up in the air, and you desperately try and catch some, maybe you'll catch two, or if you're lucky, three or four. My question is, is what, we, what, if anything, we should be doing about the fact that someone who is sectioned is automatically subject to compulsory treatment right. without separate consideration as to whether or not that is um, necessary or proportionate. Because I know that there is Strasbourg Authority, which I think from Norway or somewhere, which says that that's a breach of the convention, and no one seems to be uh, Finland, no one seems to be litigating it, so I don't know. 
what are your thoughts are on that and whether you think a challenge on that basis might be successful. There was, a, there was a really interesting case a year or two ago in the Court of Protection about a man who was detained under the Mental Health Act <coughs> and who was self-harming in a way that meant he required blood transfusions. But he was also Jehovah's Witness. <coughs> and the treating doctors could have given him a blood transfusion under their compulsory treatment powers under the Act because a blood transfusion is mysteriously a treatment for mental disorder. Um, and but, So they could have done that. But they didn't. They went to the Court of Protection and said, we could use our compulsory treatment powers, but we really don't fancy it. Could, we, could you make a decision about whether it's in this man's best interest to have a blood transfusion or not? And the judge said, well, of course it isn't in his best interest. He's a Jehovah's Witness. Um, and it would have been an abuse of your powers to give him a blood transfusion in the circumstances, which is a bit harsh, given that that's what the Mental Health Act says they could have done. And so it's a bit mean to say that it would have been an abuse of their powers to just exercise the powers that they had. But it's a really interesting illustration of the sort of um, coming together from the Mental Health Act to the Mental Capacity Act, which I think is going to continue whether or not there's some crazed new plan to rewrite, um, to rewrite them. But, um, but it's a really interesting example, I think, of, of, and I think one of the advantages of the Court of Protection is that um, it is leading to a sort of feeling that judges can look at this stuff in a way that they sort of previously didn't because it was either a tribunal who dealt, who dealt with the sort of the basics or there was this sort of judicial review claim where you weren't allowed to look at the facts and it was, and it's, it's, I think it is changing and I think you can, um, you can see that and you can see that um, it really is in the court protection that the court protection judges disagree with psychiatrists a lot so there's loads of reported cases about capacity where the psychiatrist says this person lacks capacity and the court protection judge says no they don't and that I think is really interesting as well because it, I agree in my experience that's pretty different to the way a tribunal interacts with a psychiatrist and so I think those things are going to sort of eventually um, you know, make a difference and it's particularly in relation to compulsory treatment um, that um, that case about Jehovah's Witness is a really kind of good example of a kind of first step. <coughs> you know, everyone dislikes slippery slopes, but they can be very useful. And that kind of decision is a kind of good one as a sort of starting point for running those sorts of arguments. I mean, you do, of course, touch on a fundamental aspect of discrimination with respect to people detained under the Mental Health Act, in that if you retain capacity under the Mental Health Act and you are sectioned, you cannot refuse medical treatment. But you might say that makes doctors rather lax about respecting patients' rights because they know they can fall back on the Mental Health Act to compel people to take treatment. Um, it is something that the Richardson Committee, in which I sat 20 years ago, would have addressed, and Oliver was involved with that as well, because we wanted to introduce a form of non-discriminatory mental health legislation, but that was rejected by the then Labour government with the support of Selfies in Parliament at the same time, and so we've never got non discriminatory mental health legislation. There was some improvement under the 2007 Act in that uh, the position with respect to administering electroconvulsive therapy changed so that um, there you now have to respect the wishes of a capacitor's patient. But it, it's a fundamental form of discrimination in that people with mental illness are not treated in the same way as people with physical illness when it comes to their capacitors in sense. We have a question from Alison. It was just a comment really, okay. um, go, going up from what Victoria was saying. I had a case very recently on a similar thing on treatment of HIV and encephalitis and whether that was treatment for a mental health disorder or whether that was treatment for a physical health disorder. You had a psychiatrist who said, well, it's a mental health disorder that you're treating and therefore that should be a section in which means you should go to a different hospital. Um, and that case, fortunately, was brought for protection and everyone was disagreeing with the psychiatrist that had to go through quite a long process to get there instead of the person being sectioned could remain in that hospital they needed to be treated for the physical health disorder. Interesting. Any other points or questions? Go ahead. Um, I have a question for you, with, uh, Oliver. Um, you talked about the different parts, the, the, the work that you've done in three different countries. So, ideally, I would like to believe that policy is going to take a lot of time to actually affect every single person at the ground level. But in the three or four initiatives that you've done, 
how have you been able to influence the, the organizations, so the hospitals that you were dealing with in Uganda and India, um, and were you able to make any positive change um, in, in, in the research and the work that you did with them? Because you, you've spoken about the change you made with the patients. Um, goes back to the point that, um, that um, <clears throat> mental health professionals are very powerful. And if you think they're powerful in this country, <laughs> travel to Eastern Europe or to India, um, and they're, they're treated as you know, gods. Um, and that really is the fault of judges. And you get to, no one learns about this stuff at law school. Um, people are kind of subservient to the medical approach generally. They're told what to do. Judges are told what to do as well. It's really, really difficult, I think, to um, directly influence the behaviours of um, mental health professionals and, and the systems that they operate in. But, um, but they're going to have to comply with the new laws which are going to come into force in, in India. Uh, there's um, discussion of a, a new mental health bill in <coughs> Uganda. Um, and it's going to be down to national human rights institutions like the Ugandan Human Rights Commission and NGOs on the ground to take some test cases to um, litigate against the, the hospitals because unfortunately um, service providers don't like that but th at least that does um, get some uh, changes of behaviour going but also I think it's about um, going back to universities and the way that medical schools teach students and so on and so on but it's about the you know, battles that you can win you know how what the root causes of the root causes um that and it's sort of almost endless okay question mm. thank you thank you go ahead um, i i've got one uh, very specific question and too much more general um you mentioned a case called cheshire west or oh something? yes what, Yes, it's Cheshire West and, and someone else, isn't it, against P. So there, it's always P. Uh, right. And okay, it's, what is it, 2014, 2014, UK Supreme Court, anyone? I can find it easily. Although if you just Google Cheshire West Deprived of Liberty, you'll be inundated with people ranting about it. And my two more sort of general questions are, I, I work in the criminal justice side, um, to what extent do you kind of approve, as people who know far more about this than I do, of judges overruling psychiatrists? And we get, you know, is this person fit to plead? Two people pop up and say, no, 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 no obviously not a hope in hell. No, no. And you sit there thinking, why not? But, and, but, but it's quite a brave judge who knows nothing about mental health, really, to say, Oh, I just don't agree. That's, it. Yeah. That's the end of it. <laughs> is, is, do, is it approved of? Is it appropriate? Is it... Um, I, I think it's very problematic. I mean, the, the, the judges are obviously having to use the Pritchard test from 1836 or whenever it was. <laughs> um, and they are very critical of doctors for not using the Pritchard test when it comes to making their assessments. So it's very easy. Walls is the classic example for a judge to say, well, I'm, you know, I'm really not prepared to accept this clinician's view because they didn't address their minds to the right criteria that I have to apply when thinking about unfitness. Um, so there's a, I think unfitness is particularly problematic because the whole area is fraught because it's, it, it's, it's taken such a long time for anyone to begin to address their minds to it. The Law Commission have now produced a very good report uh, to the government. It's what is it going on for 18 months now and still no response from the government and the government only have a 12 month time frame in which to respond to law commission reports so clearly that's not been top of their agenda to do anything about so unfortunately unfitness to <coughs> is going to remain a bit of a morass um, it, it's very hard to know i mean normally you would say of course the clinicians who've interviewed the patient at length and have had a um, an opportunity to assess their capacity, I've read through all of their clinical notes, you know, have to be in a possess better position to decide whether or not someone is fit to plead. But it is a legal test. Mm. Mm. Legal and, and it can have much worse consequences for the person concerned, because instead of getting a six-month sentence of being out in three, it's 
lifelong, potentially. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and the Law Commission are kind of with you on that, in the sense that they would want to see as many people as possible being put through to a conventional criminal trial with support. Mm -hmm. um, so the more people that you can get through a proper criminal trial, given kind of a, an umbrella around them of, of, of people who can support them and help them to understand what's going on, the better it is for everybody. No one wants to be dealt with under the Mental Health Act if it's not mm -hmm. necessary. And, and my final sort of general question, if you're the wrong moment to ask this, but you haven't touched on property rights, which is my sort of particular interest, and breaches of human rights in relation to that for people whose property is being taken or used inappropriately or insufficiently protected, either by people under an enduring power of attorney or le I think much less seldom, much less often by deputies. But is there a a mug's guide? Is there some way into you know, what, should we, what is the nutshell? Yes, yes on the nutshell property sorry, the Office of the Public Guardian website, mm -hmm. um, which is opg.gov.uk, um, and probably um, action on elder abuse as well might have some links on their website. Right. Um, but yeah, the nutshell in relation to attorneys and deputies is <coughs> to refer concerns to the Office of the Public Guardian to be investigated. Um, and or to bring proceedings in the court of protection. Um, but the OPG website is really the best place to start. Thank you. Can I just also say, I'm an enormous supporter of judges disagreeing with psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's the best thing because it's all made up, all of this. You know, we've invented a test about what counts as having capacity. This is in a civil context, I know mean, I mean nothing about criminal law at all. Um, but you know, we've made up this test about what counts as lacking capacity. Um, it's incredibly broad. Any impairment in the functioning of your mind or brain, you know, that's you know, me after I haven't had any lunch and I've had a really bad day at court. I mean, it's, it's incredibly broadly drafted. Um, there's no guidance about what it is you have to understand about a particular decision to have capacity. So everyone's own views about that immediately infect their capacity assessment. And um, if you didn't have the judges coming in and saying, well, actually, I think this person is pretty vulnerable, that they lack capacity or because they're making a kind of completely unwise decision that that can't be one that they've thought through. It's, um, it's brilliant it's in, and it's just essential because psychiatry is incredibly powerful oh, yeah. and you need that, particularly in the field of capacity where, you know, when it's, um, well, the judges don't tend to disagree too much with the diagnosis that the psychiatrists give, but um, they do sometimes. And there was a case about a woman who refused life-saving treat treatment for kidney disease where the, um, at the point where she refused treatment, she was di diagnosed with a personality disorder. And the judge did say, hmm, uh, <laughs> I'm not entirely convinced about the reasoning there. But, um, but so while they can be reluctant to sort of go into a diagnosis, that it's, it's essential, I think, that they then uh, have liberty to go, you know, to look in great detail at what sort of reasoning is then flowing from that on the part of psychiatrists. And it's, it's incredibly important. And those sorts of judgments in the court protection so I do a fair amount of training to doctor psychiatrists and social workers and things. Um, it's really good for them, for me to stand up there and say, look, you know, this is what one of your colleagues, a psychiatrist, said, and here's why the judge took it to pieces. And it, and it does make people, I gave a talk to, it wasn't a psychiatrist, it was a GP, I think, and I sort of said, I'm saying, and of course, you know, just because the person doesn't have capacity, it doesn't mean that it's not in their best interest to do what they want. And she came up to me afterwards, she was like, oh, that was such a light bulb moment for me. And I was thinking, well, crikey, <laughs> you know, that's scary, that's pretty basic, you know, but, but that, you know, the, takes the sort of the judges and the judgments and the judges saying this stuff I think to really give anyone any leverage to get in there and say actually you don't have a monopoly on this and you're not doing it right. I, I might also add that I've been involved with a team of people who've been developing a dynamic objective tool for assessing unfitness to plead which gets um, mentioned in the Law Commission's report so it's a way of trying to bridge that territory between the judiciary and clinicians in terms of objectively what is required for meaningful engagement with the criminal process. Answer your question, is that okay? Good. It's just raised a whole lot more. Lot. <laughs> 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 yeah. Do we have one more question if anybody, oh, do we have two? Okay, can we have a bag of Okay. Yeah, Emily from British Institute of Human Rights. Um, so we do the kind of trying to prevent things going to court rather than oh, the law side of things. This is really interesting for me. Um, I was just wondering whether I can hear your thoughts on um, ref reforms to um, the Declaration of Liberty kind of whole process. So the Law Commission has put forward a number of recommendations. We don't know what, what's kind of going on with that yet, but 
um, how to kind of manage that burden that seems to be, you know, making the whole process yeah, really burdensome and not real, and then also retaining the idea um, that was put forward in the Cheshire West judgment that rights should be, you know, everyone should have the same starting point in terms of human rights and maintaining both of those, both of those things. Listen, <laughs> 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 in 30 seconds, <laughs> I'll just speak even faster than normal. Um, so, there's really good stuff about the operation of the two safeguards, and one of the best things about it, in my view, is that it, requi it, um, it gives you a right to independent assessments of your capacity, less good because they're usually a bit shoddy, but uh, an independent assessment of your best interests. And that's brilliant because the people who are responsible for looking after you um, have someone else who's new to the situation coming in and looking at everything from a more independent standpoint. And, uh, and sometimes saying, actually, this is completely the wrong answer and you shouldn't be doing this, you should be doing something else. And so the good thing about the Law Commission uh, proposals is that that element of independent scrutiny is in there. But the bad thing is, it's only for a limited number of cases and it's not really clear how that's going to work in practice. Um, and it would be nicer if actually anyone who has um, social care needs and has a sort of um, involvement in, has other people making decisions <coughs> for them about their lives, had that element of independent sort of scrutiny of what was going on. It doesn't need to be by, by a judge necessarily, but it's sort, of, um, it's sort of a shame that the whole kind of deprivation of liberty mess has become so, um, so awful that there's a sort of risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater and sort of simplifying the whole system so that it doesn't take up too much time, but missing out the good bits and the protections that were in there that weren't really to do with Article 5, that probably to do with Article 8, but which have actually been incredibly beneficial for um, lots of people who were affected by them. And again, we'll put some links regarding the reforms probably in our, on the website so you can follow where that's going as well. Just one last question, and then we'll that was it. That was it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for your questions, your contributions. I, I really believe that I came away with a lot of knowledge today. Um, can we just have a round of applause for our panel? <laughs>